Good morning, everyone. We're just going to wait a minute or two and make sure everyone has a chance to log on before we get started. Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and get started, and the webinar, as always, will be recorded and, and posted afterwards for anyone who does happen to join us a little bit late. They can always get caught up that way. Um, my contact information will be at the end of the presentation, so if anyone is interested in having the slides sent to them, um, I would also be happy to do that if you contact me after the, the presentation. So uh, good morning again, everyone. Um, my name is Austin Matthews. I'm the EHS Assistant Program Manager at PJR, and I'm going to be hosting the webinar today, which focuses on an overview of R2 2013 uh, version of the standard responsible recycling. This slide contains uh, just a brief overview, kind of a table of contents, what we'll be covering today. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about the certification process. We'll go through, you know, at a high level, the, the requirements of R2 2013. We'll discuss the some of the most common nonconformances that we see across our audits with our various clients. Um, and we'll have time for questions at the end as well. So if you have questions as we go throughout, there's a section in the webinar um, tool, uh, task bar for you to type those questions. And I'll take a look at those at the end, and we can go through them. I'll, I'll save some time at the end of the presentation to do that. So if you have any questions, please go ahead and type them there whenever, uh, whenever you'd like, and, and we'll come to that at the end. Uh, PGR is currently the number one R2 registrar. Uh, this is uh, this page gives you an idea of some of the countries that we offer certification, um, where we currently have companies certified to R2 with PGR. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's an all-inclusive list necessarily, but uh, it gives you kind of a snapshot idea. And the slide also um, lists the, the various standards uh, to which PJR offers accreditation. Hopefully you guys aren't having any difficulties hearing me. Let me just see. <laughs> 
think we're okay. Um, and like I said, obviously today we're talking about R2 specifically, but PJR offers a variety of other certifications. Some of the benefits of getting certified, as with any certification program, um, there are benefits um, meeting legal requirements, improving the environmental health and safety performance of the organization. Obviously, um, that those requirements being within the standard, that, that's, that's kind of an obvious one, but going through the process of implementing the system and maintaining the certification, th those are some of the criteria of the system. So it certainly um, provides some structure uh, for organizations to be able to make sure they're meeting those requirements. Um, also, management commitment and employee engagement are um, implied in many of the requirements and the implementation of the different criteria of the standard uh, go a long way as far as strengthening um, that management commitment or that employee engagement depending on the portion of the standard we're referencing. Meeting stakeholder requirements, um, same, same idea, improving public image, uh, R2 and some of the different environmental standards specifically going above and beyond to obtain these certifications. Obviously, it's not a requirement, so uh, going above and beyond, taking those extra steps um, goes a long way as far as the public image, what your company is doing to make sure electronics are being responsibly recycled and, and um, educating the public and, and giving them an outlet to recycle those electronics and, and feel assured that they're being handled appropriately. Achieving objectives, again, um, through meeting the requirements of the, of the standards and implementing those, those systems, um, you're required to set and meet and work towards different objectives and continual improvement. The standards are written to help um, it to be easier to integrate together are two um, commonly integrated with ISO 14001 and, and OSAS 18001 for your environmental health and safety, or can also be um, integrated with RIOS. We also commonly see some companies adding ISO 9001 for the quality perspective as well um, and trying to make them um, easier to integrate. Uh, along with the public image, there's also a competitive advantage um, again, kind of going the extra mile sets you um, potentially out from your competitors and specifically with R2 as we'll see when we get to that section in terms of downstream due diligence, a lot of R2 certified companies are more interested in working with R2 certified vendors because there's less due diligence involved and, and again we'll, we'll come back to that but if, um, if as an organization I need to vet the downstream vendors that we're utilizing and I can skip some steps and rely on that R2 certification to do some of the work for me, that's, that's pretty appealing when that process needs to be maintained on an annual basis. So that's something to think about whether you're someone's downstream or you're vetting your own downstream vendors to be able to save some of those steps and have um, you know, the R2 certifications stand for some of that due diligence. That's, that's less work and less, less headache. Um, and because of the competitive advantage, the improved public image, achieving strategic objectives, uh, meeting legal requirements, there are a variety of opportunities to reap financial benefits as well. So um, that's just sort of an overview of benefits of getting certified. I'm, I'm sure there are plenty more, and um, if some of you have already pursued certifications with this or other standards, you may be able to provide additional examples, but those are a couple. Um, talk a little bit about PJR's certification process. So if you're obtaining certification for the very first time, um, this is our process, or if for some reason you have lost certification um, and you have to start all over with the process, so that this would also represent um, what you can expect. But in-house, we would do a documentation review prior to stage one, um, just making sure A, B, C, D, all of the requirements have been submitted. 
and your your organization is, is ready for a stage one audit, um, at which point um, the stage one would be scheduled and conducted. The stage one really focuses on the documentation, whether the framework of the system is in place. So the procedures, the manual, whatever the requirements are that we're looking at, um, have they been developed? Are they available? Are they appropriate in meeting the requirements of the standard? Um, in which case the organization is ready to move to stage two. There may be gaps identified um, and we would follow the normal process. Um, there are no formal nonconformities issued at a stage one, but there would be areas that would be noted as either concerns or nonconforming. Um, again, you wouldn't be issued a formal nonconformance, but those would be areas that we would be looking for revisions and corrections to be made um, so that we don't have nonconformities at stage two. It's kind of um, gives you that opportunity to make those changes and avoid the nonconformities at stage two. So the, the stage two after completing stage one is, is scheduled usually within 30 to 75 days um, depending on you know how the audit went when you're looking to schedule how many if any you know nonconforming or concern areas you have to rectify in the meantime um, there's a variety of factors there um, and stage two focuses on the entire management system and actually the implementation so at stage one we're focusing on that documentation framework at stage two the emphasis is on have those procedures and documents been implemented? We've already established that the documents were in place and the framework itself meets the requirements of the standard. But now at stage two, are you doing what you say you would do? Are you following your own procedures? Is the outcome of that, um, those outputs, still meeting the requirements of the standard? If not, or if there's issues with the implementation, that's when we would have formal nonconformities that would need to be resolved as a result of that audit prior to a certificate being issued. Um, and then after successful completion of stage two and resolution of any nonconformities identified, that's when um, a certificate would be issued to your organization. And both of those audits would be on-site. In the past, there were some um, off-site stage ones, potentially, depending on the scenario, but that's pretty uncommon at this point. Um, I won't say they'd never happen, but it's um, quite rare. And that is partly because when we were doing a lot of off-site stage ones, the, um, there were a lot of issues at stage two when we would get on site for the first time and find that things weren't always represented accurately or um, some of the documentation actually wasn't appropriate given the on-site um, activities that maybe were not um, explained clearly or there was a disconnect. And um, by having the on-site stage one, we've been able to avoid having as many revisits or, or on-site visits, time added, um, different things that would be frustrating for, for the organization. So we can um, kind of streamline the process and uh, not have as many of those hiccups if we have that on-site stage one to be able to, right from the get-go, make sure everything is, is clear. So that's a little bit about the certification process. Um, and at, if you have any questions about that as well, the contact information for uh, myself, the EHS program manager, and the sales group will all be on the final slide, um, and, and we can assist with any questions um, specific to becoming certified. After that initial certification, the stage one and stage two audit, the certification cycle is a three-year cycle um, following the stage two every year or semi-annually. Some, some clients go semi-annually instead of annually. Um, we would have surveillance audits. So we would have, let's say you were doing annual audits. You would have your first surveillance audit within a year from the date of your stage two. 
and that's a partial system audit in that, unlike the stage two, we don't have to cover every single process within the um, management system. We have to cover them between the two surveillance audits. So the first year, we have surveillance one, and the second year, a year after that, we have surveillance two. So between those two audits, we cover everything, and it's about 50-50. Um, the following year, being the third year, is your recertification audit, and the cycle starts again. So the recertification audit is all of the processes, again, very similar to a stage two in that the entire management system is covered. And upon successful completion of the recertification audit, a new certificate is issued for another three years, and, and the cycle starts over. And as I mentioned, some clients opt for semi-annual audits instead of annual audits, in which case um, they occur every six months. And, and again, even half of those processes need to be covered. Over, the, over one year of, of the semi-annual audits, we cover half. So it gets a little, a little confusing to explain. But, um, whether it's semi-annual or annual is, is typically up to the client, up to the organization, if, if they have a preference with scheduling or um, having shorter, more frequent audits. Um, it's not usually dictated by the registrar unless there are a high number of nonconformities, consistent issues that um, going a whole year is really not not working, and, and um, we need to help get the organization back on track. But but typically that's that would be up to you um, as the organization pursuing certification. This. Um, this is sort of a diagram to help if that was a little bit confusing. Um, before obtaining certification, you go through the stage one and two process. A year from then, you would have your surveillance. The following year, your second surveillance, if, again, you were on annual um, audit scheduling. The third year being the recertification audit, which is identical to a stage two, and we start all over from there. And you would only need to start back over to stage one if for whatever reason your certification were withdrawn or you discontinued the certification and, and subsequently a little bit after that decided to pick it back up um, you may need to start from scratch okay so R2 2013 um, is obviously for those of you who don't know, a more recent revision prior to that, we had R2 2008, but effective July 1st, 2013, um, this is the current version that we're using. And as I mentioned earlier, R2 2013 requires organizations to also be certified in either ISO 14001 and OSAS 18001 to get the environmental and the health and safety aspects, or RIOS, which is already an environmental health and safety standard. That standard already combines um, environmental health and safety. So those are the those are the current options. You can do 14 and 18 or RIOS. And again, that's really up to the organization, depending on your specific processes and activities. What what makes more sense? Um, what will be more effective uh, for your organization to implement. This slide is essentially the table of contents of the standard. There are 13 provisions for R2 2013, and we will briefly go through all of these as an overview of the R2 requirements. Also, uh, before we start on that, there are allowances, um, and the R2 Code of Practices can be referenced for more information on these. Um, this is just sort of, of highlights an overview. Um, there's a broker allowance for, obviously, for brokers, companies that are taking legal possession of the electronics or components or, or equipment, but they're not physically handling any of the any of the equipment that is outsourced. So um, in cases like that, uh, provision 4 and 11B would not apply, and provision 9 potentially may not apply, um, and that is sort of up to the discretion of the auditor to verify whether or not 
provision nine makes sense. A campus allowance, um, pretty self-explanatory if you're familiar with the campus distinction. Um, a company that has more than one physical address, but they're located close together um, and they work together as one operation to complete the different processes and activities. On the other hand, a co-location allowance is, is sort of the opposite. Um, in one location, one physical address, we may have two or more legally separate companies. Um, so that allows for one or both of them to potentially become certified and, and look more closely at where they overlap, what perhaps needs to be excluded because one company is handling certain aspects and the other is not, um, but the, the equipment isn't necessarily going anywhere because they're both sharing that space. Um, and then the FM, uh, the Focus Material Processor Allowance, looks at companies that are specifically processing, you know, one type of focus material. Um, they're not providing the full range of electronic recycling or refurbishment. Um, you know, they're really focusing on a specific aspect. So provision six for reuse, reuse and eight for data destruction would not apply. As an example, um, let's see, um, I'm drawing a blank here. I had an example and it just went out of my head. Um, we'll come back to that. Um, for R2 allowances, though, um, these are required to have permission in writing from Siri um, or the, the certification body. So you can you can claim an allowance. You can think um, as an organization that this this will apply to you, but we do need to verify that and and confirm that that is the case before we um, obviously before we formally apply that to the certificate. And we can walk you through that process also if, if you think that applies to you. So this is something to keep in mind. And again, the R2 Code of Practices document would be a source of, of further information about the different allowances. And for the FM processor allowance, the example I was trying to think of would be a smelter. Okay. So let's dig into the R2 requirements specifically then. Provision one is the overall you know, environmental health and safety management system. This is the initial section. It requires the organization to establish a scope. And then also this is where the requirement comes in to pursue either ISO 14001 and OSAS 18001 certification or RIO certification. And again, that's up to the organization. This is also where we see the requirement, which is kind of redundant because it's, it's found in 14 and 18 and, and Rios as well, but for the um, management reviews and internal audits, um, setting the objectives, things like that. R2 also in this provision is looking for a list of activities and documents necessary to conform to all of the requirements within the R2 standard. Provision two is the reuse, recover, et cetera, hierarchy of responsible management strategies. Essentially, the, over, um, the overall goal of the standard, of course, is to reuse as much as possible, recover as many usable um, components or electronics from, from all of the incoming um, materials and ultimately dispose of as little as possible, but then, you know, for the equipment or components that have no reuse or resale value cannot be refurbished um, to obviously responsibly recycle or dispose of that equipment. So this provision is, is really just kind of that overall policy, making sure that um, the, the policies and all of the procedures that come in the rest of the, the standard have that have those goals in mind and are aligned with um, the overall intent of this standard to responsibly manage um, the electronics 
it also talks about energy recovery and land disposal as um, sort of last resorts, and we'll come back to that. Provision three uh, represents applicable legal requirements. So this involves developing a legal compliance plan, which involves identifying all of the applicable um, regulatory or customer requirements, and that also includes any import or export requirements. Um, it's important to note here a common issue that we see is um, our two uh, companies will, if they're not directly exporting, for example, if they're not sending their FMs directly out of the country, um, some companies assume that the export requirements don't re re um, apply to them. However, if anywhere within your recycling chain, you know, any of your downstream vendors are ultimately exporting, it is relevant to your organization because you are responsible for everything that happens um, to that equipment downstream once it leaves your facility because um, that's sort of the nature of R2. So even if you're not, as an organization, directly exporting that material, you still, as we get into the, the requirements of the rest of the standard, you are still responsible for where that material is going, what's happening to those electronics and, and components. So that said, if a couple tiers down, the downstream vendors you're choosing to work with are exporting that equipment, it is still relevant to you um, as an organi organization to be aware of the countries that material is going to, what, what type of equipment is going where, and if there are any applicable requirements as far as um, export um, licenses or permits that are needed, any um, limits that are relevant, um, any countries that are not supposed to be accepting uh, equipment, anything that would be um, relevant, you should be aware of keeping tabs on that. And that comes back, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later, that comes into play as far as the downstream due diligence as you're vetting these downstream vendors. If you're aware that material is being exported to A, B, or C, and these different permits are required or these limits are in place, then that would come into effect as far as the due diligence that you're performing and making sure they have copies of those permits to um, provide you with or that they're aware of those limits and they're adhering to those. Um, those are just kind of some examples off the top of my head, but um, that's important to remember. Um, within exports within your recycling chain are still relevant to you as the um, top tier vendor in pursuing your R2 2013 certification. Once you've identified all of those applicable legal requirements, obviously the next step is maintaining compliance to all of those requirements. So you identify the requirements that apply to your organization and your processes and activities, and then you maintain compliance, whether that includes different operational controls, procedures, training, um, monitoring and measuring, however, however it's relevant to you, you're maintaining that, that compliance. And performing periodic compliance evaluations to spot check, to ensure, to have those records that um, clearly indicate compliance has been maintained um, and that can be performed, those compliance evaluations can be performed in-house or they can be outsourced to um, different consulting groups or legal groups, um, whatever would be applicable for your organization. Provision four, uh, on-site environmental health and safety. This is in addition to any requirements within ISO 14001 and OSAS 18001 or RIOS, um, but making sure that the organization itself and its personnel have the expertise and the capability to process whatever equipment, components, electronics are being processed at your facility. Do you have the right equipment, the right infrastructure, the um, you know competent and trained 
personnel in those key roles um, as applicable. Housekeeping standards maintained, um, the process of identifying environmental health and safety risks and hazards, and then implementing whatever controls would be needed to um, minimize those risks. And there's a hierarchy of controls that includes engineering controls, administrative controls, such as procedures, um, and PPE, protective, um, personal protective equipment controls, such as hard hats and safety glasses and, and uh, whatever else might be applicable to your specific scenario. In addition to identifying those risks and implementing those operational controls, also we're looking at um, the requirements for monitoring and sampling those risks. Are there um, airborne contaminant hazards that need to be monitor monitored on a, a, circuit, a certain frequency basis um, or noise concerns? Um, and even just more generally, the monitoring and sampling of those controls that have been implemented to ensure that they are effectively reducing those risks. So you could have the best of intentions, identify certain risks and hazards, and implement operational controls that are not necessarily effectively uh, reducing those risks. You might still see people getting injured um, or exposed to inappropriate levels of contaminants, and, and then you have to look back and, and see what changes need to be made to those operational controls, as an example. Ensuring qualified employees or one employee to manage the, the management system or to be in charge of the management system. Also, the requirement in Provision 4 exists for an emergency plan, um, emergency procedures as far as responding to various emergency situations. Have Has a plan been prepared? Has Is it periodically tested and reviewed and updated as needed? Um, that requirement is also in this provision. Before we move on to provision five, um, I'm sure many or all of you are already familiar with this, but the term focus material gets used a lot in the standard. That's um, the the main takeaway of the standard is, is focus materials. So um, just before we move into provision five, for anyone who is not clear, uh, focus materials include all of these uh, things on this slide. We have um, CRTs, uh, batteries, uh, mercury containing devices. These, there's some examples here where you might find mercury. PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, not to be confused with. Printed circuit boards, which is also a common uh, abbreviation. Circuit boards is, is the next one. Um, and circuit boards include components or equipment containing circuit boards, so some that commonly get overlooked. Um, keyboards, mice, um, things like that that contain circuit boards are also relevant. So just to prevent any confusion, PCBs in this sense refers to polychlorinated biphenyls, not printed circuit boards. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so jumping back in um, to the requirements of our two, provision five focuses on focus materials. Um, the requirements of this provision include developing and implementing a focus material management plan, this is just a high-level overview. Obviously, the standard goes into more detail, um, as does the R2 guidance document, but we're just going to go through at a high level um, the requirements of each provision. So provision five, we have the FM plan that has to be developed and implemented as applicable depending on the equipment that you're processing, removal of FMs prior to shredding or, or metals recovery, so before we shred electronics we're you know we're pulling the batteries out we're pulling um, you know pulling different different components out we don't want to shred batteries obviously for example 
<clears throat> there are two exceptions noted within the standard, and you can um, reference the, the standard document to read more about those if you think they may be applicable to you. This provision also requires, obviously, the, the processing, the recovery, the treatment of FMs, um, using facilities that meet all of the applicable regulations, have the appropriate technologies. So, again, in line with provision two, that overall policy of <clears throat> reusing and recycling as much as possible in the most responsible manner, um, this, this, again, aligns with that. And, and we talk more about this in terms of the downstream due diligence when you're going to prove that the facilities you're utilizing meet these requirements. And again here we see also again that energy recovery, incineration, land disposal are, are not, the, um, not the acceptable um, methods of, of disposal um, according to the standard except for very rare uh, um, instances which again we can we can find more about within the standard we can um, go to Siri for um, approval in those rare circumstances and get that um, in writing continuing uh, provision 5 uh, we go into detail about the selection of downstream vendors, the specific due diligence that's required at least on an annual basis to ensure that the downstream vendors you're utilizing within your recycling chain are meeting all of the requirements of R2 because as I, as I said before, even though you're outsourcing some of that processing or, or sending it away from your facility as an R2 certified vendor or organization, you would still be on the hook for ensuring that that equipment gets handled according to the standard and that um, in this sense includes vetting your downstream vendors um, to ensure their processes are going to meet the requirements and, and this is the way that we do that at least on an annual basis um, essentially auditing your downstream vendors getting the documentation getting the different evidence that you need or even conducting on-site audits um, yourself as an organization to verify the different requirements spelled out in this provision. All of the downstream vendors that you utilize have to meet the requirements of five provision five, section E, sections one through seven, at least on an annual basis, and then have that documentation, those records as evidence of that. The only exception to this would be, or one of the exceptions to this would be, if you're utilizing R2 2013 certified downstream vendors instead of verifying conformance to all of those requirements for one through seven you would only have to verify one and six because the R2 having a valid current R2 certification would um, serve as verification of the remainder. Another exception to this would be um, non-focused materials so Again, the whole emphasis in R2 is really on the focused materials. So if you are sending um, material like plastic or toner, um, well, like plastic or metals that, that don't contain FMs, then this, this wouldn't be relevant. Um, however, print cartridges, toner, things like that, they're also not focused materials. So um, we need to manage them. In line with provision two, we're, we're making sure they're responsibly uh, recycled or disposed of, but not necessarily um, all of those downstream requirements since toner is not considered a focus material. That's a lot of information and there's a lot of um, detail in the standard breaking down one through seven. So if um, if you have any specific questions related to your organization, we can talk about that offline. Or if you have general questions, make sure you you type them in. But um, that's a very specific section, um, a, a significant area as far as nonconformances during audits. Um, so that's a section to pay close attention to, provision five, specifically um, with the selection of downstream vendors. Provision six discusses reusable equipment and components. So in terms of um, 
resale, refurbishment, um, equipment that gets tested. Um, this is the provision that is, is most relevant. Uh, making sure in general that if contrary to commercial agreements, if, if your customer or you have commercial agreements that require equipment not be resold for whatever reason, that um, you're adhering to that within the organization and have a way of distinguishing that equipment from the other equipment so it doesn't get um, sold because it has resale value, that there's some way to distinguish um, those that can't be sold or donated from those that can, if that applies to your organization. Um, labeling and sorting requirements, um, according to Provision 7, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, data sanitization, according to Provision 8, which we'll also get to, and handling shipments, um, according to the transport requirements in Provision 12, which we'll come back to. The shipments have to be identified according to one of these three categories prior to shipping. Um, anything that contains an FM. So again, if there's no FMs, it's not relevant, but um, for equipment containing FMs, they have to be categorized as either tested for full functions, R2 ready for reuse, tested for key functions, R2 ready for resale, or evaluated and non-function, R2 ready for repair. The only exclusions to this, and again, there's more detail in the standard itself, would be um, items considered collectible electronics or specialty electronics. And again, um, there's a specific definition for each of those and um, more specific information in the standard that would be relevant if you think that might apply to your organization or a subset of the equipment that your organization receives. And as in provision three and five, the export requirements and downstream requirements, um, we're not required to apply those requirements, export requirements or downstream requirements, for shipments of either of the first two categories. So if you're sending um, tested full function equipment uh, for reuse, then you don't have to do the downstream due diligence on um, the organization or the buyer of that equipment. Same with key functions ready for resale. You don't have to vet every buyer or customer for those, that equipment um, because the understanding is that it's going to be reused and not disposed of or recycled. The provision continues as far as um, requirements for identifying test methods, um, ensuring legally licensed software and any device specific drivers are installed to be to meet the requirements of the first and second categories. A written quality assurance plan is required for all three categories unless you have your organization is certified to ISO 9001 or RIOS, which within the requirements of those standards, you would be meeting the requirements of a quality assurance plan, so you don't have to duplicate those efforts. For items categorized as key function, any functions not working must be disclosed in writing. So a unit can have certain functionalities um, that are not considered key functions. Um, uh, those functions can be not, not working properly um, or not included, but that needs to be clearly disclosed. The buyer has to be aware of exactly what they're getting um, so that we can be sure that um, they are, the unit is going to meet their requirements, which is sort of duplicated here. We'll come back to that. Um, but any functionality is not working, anything not included needs to be clearly disclosed. A product return plan also has to be in place for the first and second categories in that, um, let's say the client or the customer receives the equipment, it's not working properly, um, accepting those returns to make sure so that you as an organization can ensure that that equipment either gets retested, refurbished, or ultimately recycled if that's necessary um, in a way that's it's um, 
you know, meeting the requirements of the responsible recycling standard instead of um, just kind of crossing your fingers and hoping that the customer finds an R2 certified vendor to um, recycle the, the electronics and doesn't just throw them in the garbage or take them wherever. Um, the first category, full function ready for reuse, can't have any major cosmetic defects. All three categories need to meet the customer requirements and that in part comes back to um, clear descriptions, making sure that the products are accurately described and depicted so that the customer is fully aware of the condition of the equipment that they're going to get before they place that order and, and receive it. Um, also that the functionalities they're looking for are operational or are not operational, that there really aren't any surprises as far as what kind of shape the equipment or components are in. And then for the third category, since it's not being reused or resold um, and it's not functional or your organization isn't able to test um, this equipment, then the due diligence requirements of provision five would be relevant for anything in this third category. So you don't want to sell, you, you're not allowed to sell um, anything in this category, for example, on eBay because it would be impossible to vet those buyers and make sure they meet the requirements of provision five. Again, that's a lot of information. So the, the standard can be referenced, the guidance document can be referenced, and um, you know you can reach out to us with any questions about, about that. Provision seven uh, involves tracking throughput, essentially maintaining records of tracking throughput for at least three years, BOLs, uh, bills of lading, any other um, documentation that would be relevant, maintaining those, those records, and that would be sampled during an audit to ensure that they're available. Um, you don't need to track non-FMs beyond the first tier, so if we're talking about equipment or components that don't contain FMs, once it's shipped and received um, to that first tier, you don't need the um, documentation after that, but for focus materials, you do need the tracking throughput documentation all the way through to end of life, which would be, um, for example, the smelter or um, wherever it's ultimately being disposed of. This provision seven also requires you as an R2 certified downstream vendor to share your downstream vendor information with R2 certified customers or companies that are pursuing R2 certification. So either they already are R2 certified or they're in the process of becoming R2 certified upon request um, with appropriate controls. That might include um, non-disclosure agreements or whatever your organization deems appropriate, but you are required to share that information. And that is to ensure that other downstream vendors, companies that are pursuing R2, are able to get the documentation that they need to prove that they're meeting the requirements of provision five just as you as an organization would be required to. Um, at one point in time, there was a substantial amount of pushback with the different companies not wanting to share their downstream vendor information uh, for fear that um, the company would just kind of skip them and go right to the downstream vendors that they were utilizing, but it's kind of a chicken and an egg issue because to obtain certification, you need to be able to show that you've vetted all your downstream vendors to the requirements of R2 and have those recycling chains in place for all of the different focus materials that you would be processing. So um, just sort of uh, a team effort here to make sure that everyone can get the documentation that they need. So feel free to put whatever controls in place you think are necessary, non-disclosure agreements or um, whatever uh, is relevant, but you are required to share that information in these instances. Okay, provision eight involves data destruction. Pretty self-explanatory, um, whether we're 
data wiping or shredding or the variety of other methods that may be employed depending on the specific data storage devices that um, your company receives, having these documented procedures in place that meet applicable requirements. Um, an example would be um, NIST 888. So um, that would be one example of a guideline or a specification to ensure your, your um, data destruction uh, programs are aligned with those requirements. Having those documented procedures, uh, providing training on a regular basis, as well as competency evaluations for any employees involved in the data destruction process overall as it's defined by the standards. So we're not just talking about people doing the wiping or the destruction necessarily. It could also include um, people responsible for the validation or um, impl um, creating the procedures, um, things like that. Also, as I just alluded to, there are requirements for validating those processes on a predetermined basis, which would really kind of depend on your organization and how you want to handle that. Do you want to um, randomly, randomly sample on a monthly basis, a quarterly basis, an annual basis, and um, do you want to do that in-house? Do you want to use a third party? How, how do you want to go about meeting those requirements? Ensuring quality controls, security controls, maintaining all of the records to prove you're meeting all of those requirements. And again, that's really spelled out in more detail in the standard. You also have the option to outsource um, one tier. You, you have the option to outsource that data destruction, in which case additional controls are in place. And you're still on the hook for ensuring that downstream vendor is meeting the requirements of the standard. So just like you would do the downstream due diligence for a downstream vendor to provision five, if you're going to outsource the data destruction, you need to have different records and a process for ensuring that they're meeting the requirements of provision eight because they're doing that data destruction on your behalf. And you're also then on the hook for tracking and security during transport, um, making sure that um, whatever different controls you need to put in place to make sure any media bearing devices um, are, are protected until they get to the site that um, you've outsourced to and are physically destroyed or wiped or, or whatever would be applicable. Storage provision nine and uh, facility security provision 10 are pretty self-explanatory and, and sort of go hand in hand, um, protecting the electronic equipment, not storing them outside, uncovered, um, exposed to the elements, um, making sure Everything is labeled. Um, unauthorized access is prevented. You've got security measures in place, especially related to um, data bearing media that has not been sanitized or destroyed yet. Provision 11 um, is specific to R2. It talks about having the required insurance coverage having a closure plan um, and having financial responsibility for executing the closure plan, um, essentially identifying the processes that would be required to close the facility to get rid of all of the um, equipment that is stored to ensure that it's responsibly managed according to your FM plan, um, whether it's a planned closure or abandonment. So with that in mind, there also needs to be a financial instrument to cover the costs of closure, um, which cannot come from inventory. Um, it can come from equipment owned by the company, um, but it can't be, uh, inventory cannot be used to cover those costs. And that financial equipment, uh, that financial requirement, that financial instrument has to be available to someone independent of the company um, responsibility for that, those finances and um, executing the closure plan has to be assigned to someone independent in case it is not a planned uh, closure and it is in fact abandonment and that's um, a piece that often gets overlooked 
Um, and as we continue to see warehouses abandoned full of CRTs, this will continue to be an important element of the, of the requirement of Provision 11. Provision 12 involves transportation, um, packaging according to the security provision, as well as verifying, verifying that transporters meet the requirements of, of, and can demonstrate safe um, vehicle operation, and that usually involves having at least three years worth of records. And that also includes your own fleet. If you're not outsourcing the transportation, it's still important um, to have those records, to have performed that verification on the drivers that you utilize. And again, provision 13, um, just generally maintaining the documentation and records to demonstrate conformity with all of the requirements for the previous 12 provisions that we discussed. So if you're required to um, maintain a process for something or verify a process for something, here's where we have that requirement to maintain those records as evidence for an auditor um, or whoever else may come looking for that um, objective evidence. In general, the most common, that's, that's the, the standard um, in a nutshell, there's obviously more specific detail in the standard, and I apologize, I'm running a little bit behind on time, but we'll get time for questions, um, if you'll just bear with me a couple extra minutes. So, um, again, if you have more specific questions related to your specific operations, we can talk about that offline, but those are the, the 13 provisions of R2 2013. From our experience thus far with implementing um, audits to this standard, here are the most common areas of nonconformity. Um, provision 3, companies uh, not necessarily identifying all of the applicable legal requirements or maintaining compliance to them, so it could be either or or both. Um, Oftentimes that involves the import-export requirements, but not exclusively. On-site environmental health and safety is another common one. Um, have the controls been implemented effectively? Are people wearing their, are, are employees wearing their PPE? Um, is the monitoring and measuring um, being maintained? Is the sampling for noise or air or whatever might be relevant to your organization, is, is that being maintained? Um, again, are the controls effective given those results? Um, that could be about a variety of, of different things. That's a, a broad provision. Um, provision 5, as far as the downstream due diligence, is another common area. Um, perhaps some of the items are missed or audits aren't conducted um, effectively and some of those records aren't available. Um, that's a, a very common area of nonconformity. Um, the reuse requirements in Provision 6 as far as uh, maintaining the different testing requirements, um, identifying the different shipments in one of those three reuse categories defined by the standard, as well as making sure that uh, the equipment is accurately described to the potential customers so that there aren't any surprises and fewer returns. Um, that's a common area as well. Tracking throughput, um, BOL is not maintained um, for three years or in their entirety through end of life. Um, data destruction is another common area, as well as the closure plan and financial responsibility. Sometimes the closure plan is incomplete or it doesn't address abandonment in that the financial instrument is not sufficient or responsibility is not assigned to someone truly independent enough. Obviously we've had nonconformances in other provisions, but these are the most common. Okay, so that is a lot of information to squeeze into an hour. <laughs> um, it's a detailed standard. Um, and if you're pursuing certification for the first time, there are likely lots of questions, but we'll take a look at any questions that you might have. In the meantime, 
on the last slide, here is our contact information. Again, my name is Austin. I'm the EHS Assistant Program Manager. I can be reached um, at either of these. You can email me or, or give me a call. Um, Scott Jones is the Program Manager. Here is his contact information. And for a quote or other information about pursuing certification, you can also reach out to our sales department. So we'll take a look and see if we have any questions. Okay, um, one question uh, for provision five, is on-site auditing for downstream recyclers required? Let me see if I can open this. Um, on-site auditing for downstream recyclers is not required. Um, if you take a look at the specific requirements in the standard in provision five, you'll see um, there's some footnotes there, there's some additional information as well as in the guidance document. Um, it is not required across the board. There are some instances where it's recommended. Um, there might be a couple instances where it's highly recommended, um, but there are, are, are plenty of different methods that you can use to meet the requirements for that downstream due diligence. So on-site audits are, are not necessarily required. Okay, and then there's another question. Um, what is the best way to compile our legal requirements? Is there a company or service that can help with this? Um, there is not one set way to compile the legal requirements. Um, think about documentation methods that will be most efficient for your organization. Um, I've seen everything from Excel spreadsheets to Word documents, um, to, um, oh, I'm, I'm drawing a blank because I've just seen so many different formats for this. Um, some companies combine it with their compliance evaluation process in sort of a, a checklist ideal. Um, and um, others have completely separate entities where they have third parties evaluating their compliance, so they let them um, uh, use their own documentation. It really depends on what is going to work best for your organization. There's no one set answer. And as far as companies or services that can help, uh, I can't recommend any specifically um, without uh, overstepping into the consult consulting side, but there are certain certainly various consulting groups um, that can be utilized for this uh, purpose. Also, um, in some areas I've seen um, legal groups that specialize in um, the applicable requirements for, for manufacturing environments or, or different, um, kind of depends on what your processes are and what is available in your area, but um, there, there's no one set way to meet these requirements. And also, it, it's, it's possible to do it in-house if you have um, someone or, or a group of people that are that are competent enough, that are experienced enough in um, the applicable legal requirements, that it's it's also possible to do that in-house. But there isn't one set way to meet those requirements. Okay, I think we have one more question. Um, for provision 12, we use common carriers. Do we need to ask for vehicle and driver safety records from the carrier? Um, in, in this instance, and there's more specific information in the guidance document um, in this case, sometimes it can be difficult to obtain the necessary documentation, and, and Siri has addressed this, I believe, um, in the past, so they would also be a good resource if you are struggling to obtain records. Um, there are public sites that can be used um, to, to get some of that uh, information, but if a common carrier you're trying to use doesn't have that information available, you may have to get a little bit creative in how to obtain that. You may be able to get it directly from the carrier. Um, uh, I've also, I'm trying to think, I think I've seen companies that can't get that information from a public source um, contact the company and get information on how they vet um, their drivers and then sort of do a sample 
Um, but if you're concerned about the carriers that you utilize, we can talk about it offline or, as I said, Siri is another source of specific information. And going to Siri also sometimes helps because um, if, they need, if, if companies are having issues obtaining certain um, documents or, or struggling to meet requirements of the standard, they, they should be in the loop about that so that if, um, if any revisions need to be made in the standard in the future, they can take some of that information into consideration and um, maybe provide different avenues or, or um, address alternatives. Um, so um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. If not, feel free to contact me and we can talk more offline about it. But um, like I said, you, you might have to get a little creative in terms of obtaining that, that documentation. The requirement doesn't go away um, because it's a common carrier uh, necessarily. So um, we need to find a way to have some records to substantiate the, the requirements of the standard there. Okay, I know I went over with time, I apologize. Um, I don't think that, um, I don't see any other questions up here. Again, if you have any other questions after the webinar, feel free to contact me and the recording um, of this presentation as well as the slides um, of the present presentation itself will be available um, by tomorrow, if not sooner. If you don't see them, you can uh, reach out to me and I can, I can get those to you. So um, thank you for joining us today. I know it's a lot of information to digest, so take some time and if you think of questions afterwards, um, you have my contact information and we can discuss it um, offline or talk about your situation more specifically. But thank you for joining us. I hope that this has been helpful. Um, if you guys are pursuing R2 2013 for the first time or just sort of looking for a, a refresher as far as what those requirements um, uh, require. And I hope uh, if there's any other questions that you might have, we also have um, a variety of previously recorded webinars available on PGR's website in addition to um, this one that will be added. So if you have um, certain sections that you uh, feel you could use more information on, you can also always check if there's a webinar on that topic. Otherwise, um, if there aren't any other questions, I will let you go. Um, I hope you have a great day and thank you again for joining us.